Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We warmly welcome you to the plenary session of the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences of the 13th International Research Conference of General Sajor Kotala of the Defense University. Despite the immense threat due to the prevailing COVID-19 pandemic, we have come up with a new initiative to still hold this session using a virtual platform. The plenary session is under the theme of sustainable and innovative healthcare approach to strengthen the national health security. We have four eminent speakers here with us today to present their thoughts and ideas on the theme of this plenary session. We certainly believe that this will be a remarkable and knowledgeably energizing session. First, we would like to call upon Dr. Darshan Kottahachi, the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences to introduce the chair of this session. The chair for the plenary session of Faculty of Allied Health Sciences is Professor Mirani Veerasurya from the Department of Parasitology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Rome. Good afternoon, Senior Professor Mirani Veerasuriya. Professor Mirani Vasantamala Veerasuriya is the Senior Professor of Parasitology and former Dean, Faculty of Graduate Studies in University of Rome. She has obtained her MBBS from the University of Terra in 1979 and Doctorate in Parasitology in 1987 from Kushu University. Japan. Her studies over the last 30 years were supported by 24 research grants and had won 35 research awards, which includes six presidential awards, five NRC merit awards, GRC award in 2003, Vice Chancellor's award as the outstanding scientist of University of Rhode in 2005. She also won the Santa Woman of Achievements Award in Medicine in 2011. The research program initiated by her in Philorysis covered a variety of studies which resulted in many publications and presentations in national and international journals. She had delivered three very prestigious orations in Sri Lanka, which includes SLMA oration in 2003. In 2007, she was appointed as a member of WHO Expert Advisory Panel on Parasitic Diseases, Filariasis, Filarial uh, Infections by the World Health Organization. As a result of all achievements, the UNICEF Grant Commission approved establishment of the Filariasis Research Training and Service Unit at the University of Rona in 2005, which up to date serves training in Filariasis for all grades of health personnel in Sri Lanka. In addition, she was a former dean in our faculty, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences. Madam, I warmly welcome you for the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences in this session. Good afternoon to everybody and thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Kottachi, the new faculty of FAHS at present. And let me first tell you that I am so happy to be back with you all because it's a place known to me and almost all the faces are very familiar. And first, uh, let me give you some instructions about this uh, plenary session. And it's under the theme of sustainable and innovative health approach to strengthen the national health security. So under this theme, there are four eminent speakers lined up for the today's uh, session. And of them, uh, only one person will be physically present to do the presentation. Other three, two will be joining us online. And uh, of them, uh, Dr. Professor Sudarshali Vasarat Andhra is here, and Professor Chulananda Gunasekar, and Dr. ACM Fani will be joining us online, and 
associate professor Toru Negechi will be that will be a recorded presentation. So for all of all four of them, yes, the, the time allocation is 20 minutes. Out of that 20 minutes, I will take less than two minutes to do the introduction. So they will have 18 minutes for their presentation. So after all four presentations, we are going to have a uh, discussion and a questioning session of half an hour and the summing up of five minutes. That's the uh, program for today. So our first speaker is Professor Sudarshani Vasilatantri and let me give a brief introduction about... I don't know, other than I'm here. Can you hear me? Dr. Fahmi, can you hear me? There's no response from you. Dr. Fahim, can you hear me? Just get a call. Phone call. He said something. He said he can't hear me. Dr. Fahim? No, I don't think he can hear me. Consecutively for three years. 
Professor Vansal Kanthi had served as the President of Physiological Society of Sri Lanka and Vice President of the South Asian Association of Physiologists in 2016 and 2017. So uh, let me invite her for the presentation. Professor Minani Mirasolia, thank you so much, Madam, for the, those kind words of introduction. And I'm very honored to be here as, uh, like, I'm very close to KDU community. I have done lectures in physiology from its inception time to time. And I all, also supervise three students in the Life Health Sciences faculty, two PhDs and, and one named Phil. So for topic today is cardiac remodeling, an exploration of its contribution towards an optimum athletic performance. How do you measure the success of an athlete? Although competitive sports give enormous benefits to sports personnel, uh, winning events and breaking records and achieving tie beats marks the success of an athlete. So I'm going to talk about physiology of the athlete's heart and then go on to the Sri Lankan situation about the exercise-induced cardiac remodeling and explore the factors which influence the athletic performance. And lastly, I'm going to talk about cardiovascular health of athletes after retirement. Now when you look at the history of athletes' heart, we all know that athletes have large hearts. So the demonstration of large hearts in athletes dates back to the 19th century. So Hinachan in 1890 demonstrated increased cardiac dimension in elite Nordic skiers by physical examination. And then later <laughs> the same year, Eugene Daly demonstrated the same in rowers of Harvard University. And then later in 1900, Paul Dudley White studied radial pulse rate and reported sinus bradycardia among Boston marathoners. So later, with the introduction of radiography, uh, ECG, MRI, and uh, CT, C echo, all these things were confirmed. So when you talk about athletic training induced cardiac remodeling, why do you want cardiac remodeling? Athletic training induces changes in the cardiovascular system, mainly in the heart, to provide necessary oxygen to the exercising skeletal muscles. And exercise intensity is proportional to the body's demand for oxygen. And increased oxygen demand is met by various mechanisms. One is by increasing the oxygen uptake in the lungs. And increase in transport of oxygen-rich blood from lungs to skeletal muscles by way of cardiac output. And increase in oxygen unloading in skeletal muscles. However, this Training induced cardiac remodeling 
provides enough oxygen to the exercising skeletal muscles by way of increasing the cardiac output. So if you go to physiology, cardiac output, that is the volume of blood ejected by each ventricle per unit time, is a product of stroke volume and heart rate. So if you want to increase the cardiac output, if you the increase in stroke volume or increase in heart rate or increase in both will increase your cardiac output. So elite endurance athletes with sufficient training can increase their cardiac outputs up to about 40 milliliters, 40 milliliters, 40 liters during maximal exercise. Now we will look at cardiac remodeling and try to compare the cardiac remodeling in endurance versus strength training. In endurance training, that is basically where there is more isotonic exercises, there is volume overload in the ventricles due to increase in end diastolic volume, which leads to dilatation of the ventricles and increase in ventricular wall thickness of eccentric time. Then in strength training, with lot of isometric exercises, there is a pressure overload in ventricles due to increase in total peripheral resistance, which increases in ventricular wall thickness, mainly the concentric type. So both these types can lead to dilatation of the ventricles and increase in ventricular wall thickness, which will lead to an increase in the stroke volume and they are by increasing the cardiac output. Now this shows the echo pictures of what you see in echo in eccentric ventricular hypertrophy in endurance training and concentric, uh, the, and concentric ventricular hypertrophy in strength training. Now when you look at the heart rate changes in athletes, Exercise training is known to reduce the resting heart rate or cause sinus bradycardia with training. And the mechanisms postulated are training induced increase in vagal tone and remodeling of ion channels in SA node bringing about intrinsic electrophysiological changes. As an example, down regulation of the HCN4 honey channel is known to reduce the firing rate of the cardiac pacemaker, thereby reducing the resting heart rate. So when you rest, when the resting heart rate is decreased in an athlete, during athletic performance, there is a chance of increasing the heart rate and then thereby increasing the cardiac output. However, maximum heart rate is not increased with exercise training. So now you can see with even in endurance or in uh, strength training athletes, cardiac output can be increased by increasing the stroke volume and also by increasing the heart rate. Now with this background knowledge in physiology, if we look at the Sri Lankan situation in national level elite middle distance runners, these findings are actually from our collaborative work with the uh, Institute of Sports Medicine and the cardiology unit of the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. And I'm going to present the details of 800 meter national pool. So 800 meter runners in the national pool, there are about approximately 40 athletes in the national pool, mainly from forces actually and the timing is between 1.48 to 1.55 minutes and we were able to uh, get data of 30 athletes in this group that is 75 percent of the total. Mean age of those athletes was 25 years and average duration of national training was about 5 years and the average daily training was for about five hours. And now, when you see these 800 meter uh, runners, they are a, for the 800 meter running, you need 
the combination of endurance and strength training because the energy energy production is about 40% aerobic and 60% anaerobic and we have observed that athletic training could bring about evidence of cardiac remodeling in these athletes the ecg findings were in 64.3% the heart rate the resting heart rate was less than 55 per minute and in ecg uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy was diagnosed in ECG criteria of 80% of the cohort. And when you look at the echo findings, left ventricular hypertrophy was diagnosed in 86.6% based on left ventricular septal thickness and left ventricular end diastolic volume and the left ventricular end diastolic diameter were within the normal limits. However, they were significantly higher than the age, sex and BMI matched non-athletes. So that means, now in summary of these findings, you can see that 800 meter national level runners, the cardiac remodeling has occurred in them and they have uh, sinus bradycardia along with left ventricular hypertrophy in a majority of them and right ventricular dilatation and red, red, left atrial strain in a few. So that means we, we get an indication that the training has been effective in them because they, the training has been able to bring about cardiac remodeling in these athletes. Now, something to add, and all these athletes had normal cardiac functions because the ejection fractions were normal, capital E simple E ratios were normal, and none had left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. So with this, I want you to see the Sri Lankan 800 meter international performance. I have considered the male performance only here because to simplify the matters and I have included the uh, performance in past five years. And I want you to note the number of medals that we have won. This is international medals and also the names of the athletes who have won. So in 2015 we have five medals and four of them were obtained by one athlete and in 2016 two medals same uh, athlete and then 2017 five medals three by the same athlete and 2018 four medals different athletes however two events are junior events and 2019 one medal same athlete so what are your observations? So we can observe that although there is intense training and cardiac remodeling enough to provide enough oxygen and training doesn't only give cardiac remodeling, there are other advantages of training. Still, our athletes have been able to win just a handful of medals, right? Achievements are very minimal. And also, although we have a very rich national pool, you can see that all the, uh, all the athletes in the pool have not been able to gain any uh, achievements, right? So there is a problem somewhere. So this is uh, Induri Herat. He is the number one 800 meter runner in Sri Lanka. And just look at the Sri Lankan record of Indunil Hera. Just in comparison to the world record of the Kenyan athlete David Rudisha. So I want to I want you all to look at these two and appreciate the potential of our Sri Lankan athletes. Now why are they not achieving in spite of their training? 
Now, training is the one which is concentrated mainly by the coaches and also by these athletes. However, there are so many other factors which influence athletic performance. Heredity is an area which Sri Lankan uh, sports personnel law authorities haven't thought about. And also, there are so many factors here. However, in our previous research, we have noted that nutrition, sports psychology, and biomechanics are some of the areas that need attention, very close attention. Now I have come to the uh, end of my presentation and before ending I would like to talk a little on the long term cardiovascular health of the athletes. Now athletic heart is usually benign, that means when they stop training, the heart comes back to normal. But however, it has been noted that especially athletes with lifelong training have certain cardiovascular pathologies such as incidence of arrhythmias are known to be higher in athletes. Then pathological remodeling of the heart, especially in ultramarathoners and long distance cyclists. And extreme bradycardia is noted, that is about 30 beats per minute requiring pacemaker implantation. So what can we say about this? Our athletes are, it's a national treasure. Therefore, it is very important that the authorities take responsibility and to look after their overall health and well-being even after retirement. So in summary, athlete's heart is one of the best examples of adaptive physiology and Sri Lankan 800 meter athletes show satisfactory cardiac remodeling which is an indirect indication of the success of their training. Since a multitude of factors affect athletic performance, a holistic approach is important for higher achievements. And although athletes' heart is considered benign, athletes with a lifelong training history may experience irreversible cardiac pathology requiring lifelong monitoring and care. These are the references if you want to read about it more. And thank you for your patient listening. Professor Vansal Tantri for that very clear and informative uh, and very informative presentation and I'm sure there will be questions from you all again. Our next presenter is Professor Chulananda Gunasekara, whom I am happy to introduce to you all as I named Chula as an undergraduate student. We were in the University of Peradeni at the same time as medical student. Chula Gunasekara is a consultant anesthetist based at King's College Hospital London with an interest in nursing and allied health education. He was formerly the professor of anesthesiology at University of Peravi. Founder Dean of the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences Peravi, founder member and twice the president of Sri Lanka Society of Critical Care and Emergency Medicine founder chair of the specialty boards of, boards of study critical care medicine and emergency medicine of the postgraduate institute of medicine of Kalam. Dean faculty of medicine university of Peradeniya and founder president of the charity of the charity friends of critical care. He was instrumental in initiating national kidney transplant program in Sri Lanka. He is widely experienced in developing and implementing academic curricula, especially with multidisciplinary input. His passionate interest on enhancing nursing and allied health education in parallel with that of medical education was based on his belief that all health delivered staff education is paramount to improve quality of health care in Sri Lanka. He is a clinical academic with a significant research impact and his current teaching makes his 15. 
Professor Chula Purasekara, it's up to you for your presentation. Oh, um, good afternoon, Professor Virani, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, nice to you. I can I can't see you, but I can hear you. We do not right. see you, but can we you can see hear you. I can, we can see can't my No, we can't see you. We can't see your slides. I, I you can't see my slides. Okay, let me see. Slides are there, but okay. I put in for sharing, so don't sound like something. Can you see now? No. What is that? There's there something slide. over the slide saying check. So any, any possibility of removing that part? Then okay, that's fine. Very good, very good, very good. Okay. It should start working now. Ah, good? Now I, we can see that. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, yes. thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope. Um, um, uh, others like Vice Chancellor, the Dean, the Senior Academics and Colleagues and Students, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for hearing this at any time. I hope it's has been recorded and then displayed later on. I'm actually honored to by, by your invitation to talk in this platform for the second time in my career. Today, it will be a pleasure for me to share some of my own experiences for your benefit. The theme of this conference has never been so relevant to Sri Lanka. That is to say the role of research and innovation for sustainable development. I thank organizers for their innovative efforts, but sad for not being able to be with you in person due to restrictions on travel. On the other hand, I propose we take this opportunity to explore how we can make the best of this new normal for the future. For those of you who don't know, I thought of putting my background on one slide. Uh, since qualification as a junior doctor from Delhi in 1980, I have now served a total of 20 years in Sri Lanka and 20 years in the UK in the Mets. In other words, I have lived and learned the values and cultures of two different societies. They differ significantly. I have led many projects to enhance quality of education in Sri Lanka and in the UK and done research degrees in both environments. Despite all good intentions, sometimes the opposition that develops against your projects can become personal, escalating even up to death threats. For example, the BSc Rating Center course was abandoned in 2006 because of the opposition of GMA oncologists who blocked all training for Regrettably, in my experience, the opposition to change is greater in developing countries when compared to developed countries. One difference is that UK society usually compliant and complain to modify the changes made, whereas we just complain and block, leading to a stop. Thus, we fail to implement necessary changes early enough. This is also partly the reason why we remain developed with a widening gap. This slide gives you a taste of what it can be. This was the reception I had for promoting university education for nurses and analysis workers in this country 15 years ago. Many of you may not be aware that the survival of those programs and for the small window of opportunity secured by the Supreme Court. After defending the need for analytical education for over six years, I had to provide a counter argument for this at each occasion to extend where one lawyer asked me whether I was a lawyer. The end result was eight students had to travel 50 kilometers up and down the Kurnagala for clinical training, but they survived. Let's learn from the past and move to the future. We are now within a pandemic that has affected the whole world. The darkest country mark are the worst and This is partly because some leaders dissociated from scientific direction, putting both their countrymen and themselves at risk. Look at Sri Lanka. There is barely any color 
This is no coincidence. It is exceptional. Regrettably, now we enter the second phase due to reasons similar to that of the darkest on the map. We learned two big lessons during this pandemic. Firstly, we learned the benefits of leadership, working in a timely manner together with scientific advice, and the importance of an established public health system to achieve COVID control. This was a great success and contribution. But now, we also witnessed the results of dropping the guard. Secondly, we learned that we cannot stay at home forever as a nation. Not working was not a viable option. We had to go back to work. You may recall that most of us as students and even our seniors today look at the government as a money trick. This is because when we shake them, sometimes there was a good result. At one time, we even got two kilograms, two kilograms of rice a week for free. Didn't we? we have now learned with no uncertain terms that there is no money trade in the government. Why was that? This is because we had no reserve capacity as a country. Why is that now? The problem was most citizens did not understand how the money reserves came into the government. Even to date, there is no basic module or teaching in any of our medical or allied health teaching programs to let students know how the nation financed itself. I'm not an economist, but I learned the basics from UK ordinary systems. They all know how it all works. Focus on our GDP. This is termed gross domestic product. Basically, this refers to our productivity as a nation. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were sending 90% of our income to pay our debts. We had only 10% of our income to do anything. This is a critical point. The problem here is if we are not careful, we will have to sell our assets to find cash. What happens then is external investors who want to buy our assets will focus on our potentially most profitable ones. This will leave us a nation in a desperate state, never to be able to recover from this shock deficit. We need to come out of this problem. Let's see what has happened to us. In 1948, when we became independent, we had no debt but surplus instead. When Asia became independent in 1957, Somalia in 1960, and Singapore in 1965 from Malaysia, see what happened to their GDP in the subsequent years. Today, Singapore GDP is 15 times higher than ours. They took off in late 1970s, when we were engaging in a part of resolution of differences through violence. The end result 30 years later is that we are 15 times poorer compared to Singapore. What is the secret? They have research and innovation at the forefront of what they do. Look at Malaysia. They got independence in 1957 and had racial rights 10 years later, similar to ours in 1958. But they took stern action to stop racial segregation and develop as a nation. Their GDP is three times higher than us. For us, the only resolution is to reduce waste and enhance income. This is where the most important factor comes in, that is the research and the innovation. Reducing waste includes time, money, energy, food, and more. This will help our nation not just economically, but environmentally also. However, most of you will complain that we have been working hard for years but not seen any benefit. That is very true. That is why we have to get rid of the third most important factor, the corruption at all levels. GDP depends on work that is effective, efficient, and productive. We have to work smart, not just hard. That needs many resources and most are education. More specifically, 
We need education, leadership, resources, opportunity, motivation, and facilitation. We need to work with research evidence and not research advice, as the latter in this country is often biased by opinion. Work with research evidence gives the best outcome. Look at this picture. Some of you will see a rat, some others will see a duck. Only a few would see both. This is why we need evidence based, debate based governance. Opinions are not always correct. That is why evidence based approach will not only keep us in the right track without disastrous mistakes, but also attract united support. Research evidence does not come free. It needs appropriately generated data. Data needs to be of quality to achieve the most useful evidence support which we can depend upon. Generating quality data needs good research designs. This needs trained personnel and facilities. This needs funding, active support, and most importantly, motivation, which is scarce in our setting. For example, I was put on a vacated of course during my PhD, and luckily an ombudsman revoked it for me to complete it because my university violated my work. We also need incentives, opportunities, and wider recognition for researchers for motivation. Take, for example, medicine. Research output from the Ministry of Health is virtually nil. The reason there is no motivation. It does not count for anything. Not even for senior. University doctors do this because this is required for their promotions. In contrast, in Malaysia, if a university staff member makes an innovation, the university take over full responsibility for patenting and establishing commercial entrepreneurships and offers 70% of net profit to the innovator. In Sri Lanka, the maximum a university staff member can claim for an innovation is 25% of salary increase, whatever the profits is the innovations are generated for the university. In addition, there is minimal or no support in funding for patenting, etc., or establishing partnerships. <laughs> Evidence-based solutions to our problems in the future will reduce our wastage and promote growth. For example, our national cost of road traffic accidents is equivalent to 2 to 4 percent of your GDP. But research has been done to see to resolve this ongoing issue for years. Accidents happen because one user does something that the other did not expect. That is why the road discipline is so important. We have plenty of descriptive so called research. We can say how many three years or more cycles were killed. But we have never tried to analyze data to find evidence on the root causes. Lack of an evidence-based approach for resolution is the reason for rising rate of fatalities on our roads despite the best efforts of the world. Nine people die every day in our roads. For each one killed, 11 others get injured in addition to the property damage we suffer. Research can help us save 4% of our GDP and human life. Lives are invaluable give opportunities for education and they will strive to uplift us as a nation. Higher education is a must for us to become a developed nation. Although the absolute number of admissions to our universities have risen from 15,000 in 2005 to 30,000 in 2019, look at the reality. Nearly 60% of our children qualify to be admitted for university education but only 10% have been offered a university place since 1990. This is virtually static. In contrast, nearly 40% of the workforce are graduates in developed countries. We need serious consideration to enhance this and create learning opportunities of quality to ensure our future workforce will be graduates of multiple expertise. Education and health are best investment opportunities we have. The highest ranked universities in the world have 25 to 30 percent international students. This not only brings money to the country, but promotes those universities as educators 
educators across the world, yet we don't even allow 1% of foreign students in our universities. Renewable energy is another avenue that has exceptional potential for exploration and national land, yet we have not done much to promote this. Let's also talk a bit about nursing and analytic science. These are professions that are in great demand all over the world and also advancing very fast using their own research guided by their own seniors. Take for example nursing. There are so many subspecialties that need special training. Nursing in critical care, neonatal units, oncology, pediatrics, cardiology, dialysis, transplantation, perioperative care are a few. It is time that we start offering subspecialty training for them to be able to conquer the world and show their capabilities. Just look at this advancement that I published in Aristotle this year. We embarked on a caring spinal bifida in babies in second trimester using keyhole surgery for the first time in the United Kingdom. This is a picture from such surgeries. Except three members of staff you see in this picture, all others are nurse specialists who make such advanced work safe and possible. We cannot advance in medicine without them. They are part of the team. The support they provide is phenomenal. This is a picture taken during the surgery. The baby is anesthetized transplacentary. Surgery is carried out completed within two to three hours. The key is to appropriate, do appropriate research using the correct methodologies. Please design your project to answer the questions you want. Look at the outliers very carefully. They are the basis of innovation. Research, innovation, and evidence-based practice across the country is fundamental for sustainable national development. It is a motto that we all should learn to honor in our culture. We need to invest in research. It is never a vital fund, unlike many other ad hoc investments that have been made us all suffer in debt. We have to learn from our past and look at the challenges of the future to offer realistic solutions for the anticipated problems supported by an evidence base. This is the only way we can ensure a greener future for our children. There is no shortcut. We just have to work smartly, constructively, and in unity as a nation. Sustainability is the next that needs focus after commencing your research. In general, good research leads to further research and attraction without end. Just take this simple example. What do we do need to keep a sure repair shop away? It's confidence, adequate staff, infrastructure, customers, finances, accessibility, feedback, and to maintain the demand of the customer. It's not no different for research for sustainability. The research and innovation should meet the needs of the society, economy, and environment. I know very well, if I apply what I learned in medical school for the current practice four years later, it will be endlessly that I'll be endlessly attending the course to resolve the medical legal issues that I have created for myself and not for the hospital job. Thus, Daily education and updating is important not just for the medical profession, but all staff members. In developed countries, every staff member, big and small, must have a personal development plan. Thus, uh, stepwise, the, 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 the personal development plan is annually discussed and agreed with your supervisor. So the stepwise, every year, all staff members adapt to a new norm advance. This process is called the appraisal. Basically, the junior tells what he, she wants to do next year together with the senior and both together decide what is realistic, appropriate and affordable. The progress made is reviewed the following year before the next year's PDP. The purpose is to allow people to think freely what they want to develop and the institution to see how to support it. People who does not follow appraisals will eventually have a problem 
no seniority, no promotions, no salary increases. This is another essential aspect of sustained development in any institution. The appraisal demand personal development plan, or PDP, should focus on smart objectives. What do you mean by smart? This means the agreed personalized objectives should be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time -limited. In other words, the appraiser agrees that PDP are achievable, and both parties, that is to say the staff member and institution, are going to support each other to reach the set goal. The rates of PDP achievements or its failures and reasons for it are for discussion and not rectification at the next appraisal. That is mandatory at the appraisals. This ensures all staff members advance annually and becoming automatically, automatically competent to maintain pace with the institution. KU has invested in quality education. Now is the time to create opportunities and assist researchers to achieve the next step, quality research on a substantial scale. I will conclude here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Chula Gurusekar, for that very informative presentation, uh, highlighting the value of research and innovation, and you quoted some very, um, some excellent examples. I'm sure there are questions from this young staff from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The third presentation is from my pro associate professor Toru Negishia. That will be a recorded presentation. That Professor Tom Medici is currently working as an associate professor attached to the Department of Radiological Sciences, Graduate School of Human Health Sciences, Tokyo Metropolitan University, Japan. He has obtained his higher educational qualifications from Nihon University Graduate School, Tokyo University of Science and International University of Health and Welfare. His primary teaching areas are optimization of the medical exposure and quality control of mammography equipment. His research interests are medical radiation equipment engineering and X-ray inspection technology. He has received 11 awards including excellence award for construction of educational simulation system of helical CT device using line type laser light at the 7th Japan Society for Health Sciences in 2015. He has published many radiography books and research articles in high impact journals. He is the Vice President of Japanese Society of Radiation Technology and also an active member in several professional organizations such as Academic Exchange Committee, Standardization Subcommittee, Japan Breast Cancer Screening Society, Japan Breast Cancer Screening Quality Control Central Organization, Japan Radiology Association, and Japanese Society of Medical Education. Hi everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. My name is
Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. My name is Tom Nakis. I want Margaret Nawa Nakis. Sapa Anika Kumakta. Do you understand my speaker? Okay. There are about 6,000 to 7,000 kilometers from Sri Lanka to Japan. Japan is a small country. Our Tokyo Metropolitan University, Arapa campus, is located in the north and eastern part of Tokyo. Today, I will talk about the e Wonder North Japan TRL 2020. The reference material is ICRP Publication 135. ICRP Publication 135 is written about diagnostic difference level in medical images. The DRLs are a tool for institutions to become aware of using higher doses than other institutions and to facilitate the process of dosing optimization. The ICRB defines DRLs as a form of investigation level used as a tool to aid in optimization of protection in medical exposure of patients for diagnostic and investigational procedures. DRLs are set by country, per region, or local. This is because equipment and procedural protocol may vary from country to country and from region to region. Comparison of local practice with TRL values is not sufficient by itself for optimization of protection. If the median of the institution is higher than the median for the country, the median for the country may be a target for further optimization. However, if the median value at the institution is lower than the median value for the country, an assessment of whether the image quality or diagnostic capability is sufficient can be prioritized in the optimization process rather than those. DRL quantities should be appropriated to the imaging modality being evaluated to the specific study being performed and to the specific size of the patient. Quantity use for DRL should be easily measured or determined. DRL quantity assess the radiation dose used for a medical imaging procedure not uh, absorb those to a uh, patient or organ. The only exception is mammography, for which DG may be used. DG is MDD. Introduction. We have to guarantee the appropriate image quality of mammogram. We assess the mean grander dose measured by the Japan Central Organization on Quality Assurance of Breast Cancer Screening. 
JCOQABCS from 2014 to 2019. This is the organizational chart of JCOQABCS. JCOQABCS consists of three committees and each committee has both of mammography and ultrasound committee. Educational and training committee provide the training, examination and certification for individual MD and RT. Image assessment committee provided the assessment and certification for the facilities. The image assessment committee uh, manage the tools. This slide shows the process of certification for facilities. The document examination is performed first and then the image quality and positioning of the mammography are evaluated. Then, measure the MZD using radio photoluminescence glass dosimeter. Homopensive evaluation. Mammogram evaluation is image quality breast density, contrast, sharpness, noise, face density, positioning, parameter display, irradiation ranges, and artifact. And the metal being granular dose. Image assessment and document. Detection of simulated region needs to be the reference value or more. Mean ground dose needs to be 3.0 milligram or less. MDD data is DLL2050 meta. 4,800 devices in 30 years. This time, we made up more than 2,700 units in 5 years. MDD measurement used radio photoluminescence glass dosimeter. Measurement item was half value layer, entrance air cover, and an um, MGD by IEC method. This is the distribution of the mean granular dose. Since we also evaluated the image qualities. We determine the diagnostic reference level for mammography in Japan to be 2.4 million, which was on a level of 95 percent. This slide shows the distribution by city, screen film system. CR system and FPD system. This box chart is twenty five percentiles, seventy five percentiles, fifty percent times and Medium.
The characteristic of Japan was that it used a lot of CR systems, many, many CR systems. Because there is a company that developed the CR system. As a result, the CR system is rising the MGD. This slide is distribution of NGD in CR systems. It recommended for CR system to use a combination of polygon target and logical filter. However, as you can see here, too few facilities chose this combination. Also, we have other problems. This slide shows the transition of the system that passed the facilities evaluation. Look at this screen film system has almost disappeared. And FPD system are uh, becoming mainstream. In the future, it will be an FPD-based MGD. As additional considerations, we examined 2D mammography and tomosynthesis. A survey for a particular examination in the facilities would normally involve the collection of data on the DRA quantity for at least 50 patients. FBD type mammography unit display entrance air comma and DG. We collected data for at least 50 patients per FBD type mammography unit to account for variation in breast size. Results from 20 to 30 facilities are likely to be sufficient in the first instance. This slide is the distribution of 2D mammography in the FPD of the mean grander dose. We determined the diagnostic reference level for 2D mammography in Japan to be 1.43 mg, which was on a level of 75 percentile. This slide is the distribution of tall synthesis of the mean granular dose. We determined the diagnostic reference level for tomosynthesis in Japan to be 1.53 mg, which was on a level of 75 percentile. We should present a DRS for patient in order to ensure radiation safety. In the future, estimation of MGD will be performed using dosage data displayed by a mammography unit. following 
nephrotoxicity, clinical pharmacy, and pharmacy education. He is currently a research fellow at the University of Sydney, University of New South Wales, and also member of Board of Directors of South Asian Clinical Toxicology Research Collaboration. He is serving as a member of the Medicines Evaluation Committee and the Clinical Trials Evaluation Committee of the National Medicines Regulatory Authority, Sri Lanka. He is also serving as a task force member of the Working Group of Human Resources formulating the National Medicine Policy, Sri Lanka and a Strategic Implementation Plan in collaboration with the WHO. He is a member of the International Society of Nephrology since 2014. He is also a full-time member of the Asia Pacific Association of Medical Toxicology and Pharmaceutical Society of Sri Lanka. He was awarded presidential awards for scientific research consecutively each year since 2003 up to date. He is also listed as an early career researcher in one of the program grants of NHMRC. He has published widely and has a Google Scholar Edge Index of 22. Dr. Fahim was part of a three largest randomized controlled trials, trials in toxicology conducted in Sri Lanka. Dr. Fahim, it's up to you for your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mirani. Um, I hope you can hear me and also can see my slides. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, the slides are okay? Can you see the slides? Yes, you can see the slides, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction, Professor uh, Mirani, and also uh, good afternoon to everyone um, presenting today. Um, so over the next 20 minutes, I would like to talk about uh, one of uh, the new field, uh, I mean, which is the new field for Sri Lanka but it is more, more, more or less very established uh, throughout the world. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about the impact of clinical pharmacy services, um, which will optimize the medicines of the nation. So, and we do it in Sri Lanka. So the medication errors uh, are preventable. I reiterate again, it's a preventable adverse prevalence, um, while uh, medicine is still under control of the healthcare professionals. The many medication errors are causing um, 250,000 deaths. It is one of the top five uh, in most uh, in, uh, developing com developed countries. It cost an estimate, uh, estimated uh, cost of US dollar 42 billion annually, which is huge in terms of 0.7 uh, percentage of uh, global health expenditure. So this. Uh, uh, burden and uh, the expenditure could be reduced because the medication errors are mostly preventable. So based on this uh, important uh, uh, necessity, WHO, in its third uh, global pa uh, patient safety challenge, um, one of the objectives is to reduce the harm from the medicines uh, by 50% in another two years to come. So what are the, those uh, medications which may be important uh, or medicational situation which need an uh, important priority? So one is uh, one of the major category WHO listed is high risk medications including anticoagulants which are widely used in most settings, antibiotics, and importantly uh, polypharmacy which is highly associated with uh, adverse drug events. And also transition of care, like that's where the, uh, the uh, medication errors are from to happen. So this is a typical uh, uh, prescription or so drug chart you can see in a dialysis unit uh, in in in, period, I mean, in bottom of hospitals. You see a polypharmacy of like more than a minimum of 15 drugs, and the risk of getting uh, adverse effects are very high if uh, these are not checked. Do you think that something happened, uh, the drug interactions or drug related problem uh, will not only happen in polypharmacy? There's a simple example. This is the evidence coming from Australia where the two drugs, uh, oricanazole and simvastatin, been uh, prescribed together and patient took this and reported um, a very severe abdominalysis muscle damage. Um, it is obviously a simple two drug regime uh, prescriptions but 
this could have been avoided because uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a medical professionals and pharmacologists and pharmacists, they know that, that uh, varicomazole can inhibit the metabolism of synesthetic, increasing its level in the body, causing the overall toxicity. Therefore, multiple check at several points may minimize these harms, which is which can be prevented. So who can who will do this? Uh, can uh, a trained pharmacist make a big difference? Especially, this may be true for Sri Lanka, where uh, the, the wards are overcrowded. We have limited number of uh, doctors and nurses, and having an, another extra hand will definitely help um, the patients and their outcome. So, uh, as skilled pharmacists, as per WHO and uh, International Pharmaceutical Federation, they call them as seven star, uh, eight star pharmacists. It was seven star initially, and then they've incorporated recently a research company. So, uh, a full fledged pharmacists have all these skills and characters as part of their um, the curriculum development and training. So, one of the main, thing, uh, uh, main activities the, uh, the pharmacists do is uh, patient care process or, or pharmaceutical care, we call them. So, by, doing a, uh, by working in an interdisciplinary uh, team uh, of health people, including nurses, doctors, and other healthcare professionals, they will make sure the, the drugs, uh, medicine which are given to the patients are, are optimal. And uh, to do that, they will collect assets and plan and implement. And again, while doing that, they will keep on following up to ensure that the optimal therapy is delivered. So that is the pharmacy. The pharmacy is a broad role. And as the two lines talk mentioned, each discipline has a lot of specialities. And uh, now it's time for we'll be looking at specialities, especially one of the key areas for pharmacies to work is the clinical pharmacy. So as a clinical pharmacy, as I mentioned earlier, um, it is new to Sri Lanka, but it has been established, well established in most part of the world, including the developing countries. So a clinical pharmacies, they are drug experts, um, uh, they, need, they know the drug-drug interaction, drug-disease interaction, and all other interactions. They have good knowledge of the disease, and they are, are within the clinical pharmacy. They have different disciplines, including nephrology, cancer, and various other disciplines. They also have a very good uh, laboratory and diagnostic skills, and uh, obviously they should have should have big communications and patient monitoring skill, uh, and finally therapeutic planning and modifying the treatment. So one of the key roles. Um, clinical pharmacies do is that optimize uh, medicines optimization where the drugs are given appropriately uh, without causing any harms and and and, uh, and it is given in a rational way. So the overall uh, medicine optimization results in improved uh, patient outcomes. And this is one of the important aspects we see as part of uh, clinical pharmacy activities. So what clinical pharmacists they do? They do a number of activities, uh, including clinician medication history taking. They look at what medications patients come on when they present. And then they do the reconciliations. They do a number of other activities as a result. Uh, by the time they, they hand over the medications, you see that uh, a patient might be bringing a lot of adverse uh, even drug-related issues. By doing all these checkups and activities, we minimize the harm to the patients by reducing the risk. So workforce and numbers are very important to establish in a, in a, in a hospital and in a healthcare institute. The higher workforce and the uh, studies have shown that uh, reduced number of drug events. So is the number of uh, workforce or number of pharmacies enough? Um, it's probably not, and you need to have a, a trained and skillful pharmacist to overcome those uh, issues. So while doing uh, producing the graduates, it's important that uh, a workforce planning and training is developed. So workforce development is important. That's again been highlighted in the earlier speaker uh, by the speaker, and as a, and also give more opportunities to various uh, regulatory bodies to strengthen 
the model pharmacy. So, so we have a model models of care in terms of uh, critical pharmacy. So, the question arises: uh, Is Sri Lanka is well placed to uh, practice uh, critical pharmacy? So if you look at the pool of all the pharmacies working in Sri Lanka, only you will find three postgraduates, mostly in the academics, and you find um, some graduates and diploma holders and certificate holders. Mostly graduates and diploma holders, they, they work in hospitals. And uh, prior to 2010, there uh, was a Jura I mean, a revolutionary um, step in bringing the uplifting their like, health education in Sri Lanka. Um, so by 2010, we have the, the uh, Bachelor of Pharmacy graduates. And before that, the clinical pharmacy component was not in the uh, curriculum. Now, clinical pharmacy uh, curriculum uh, component was in incorporated in the, uh, the, the graduate curriculum. And then uh, we produced uh, all the last 10 years. Almost uh, six universities are producing a pharmacy farm graduate or pharmacy graduate, including KDU, and roughly around 150 graduates each year. Now, um, the point is whether these pharmacies are, are enough or they, they are capable of doing it. So, to do so, we need to support, show by the evidence. The solid research evidence are very important, and we have evidence from all part of the world, uh, from UK to US to many developing countries, uh, showing, including a, a systematic review on, on the impact of clinical pharmacies in healthcare settings. And that is a well-established norm, and uh, at least part of the routine care and their practice. So what uh, Sri Lanka has in uh, to develop that speciality and uh, to teach uh, clinical pharmacy curriculum, which was new to Sri Lanka in 2010, uh, the University of Kerala took the leadership on the collaboration, um, um, and which collaboration we now call them as uh, Collaboration of Australian and Sri Lankan Pharmacy for Practice, Education, and Research. That uh, this collaboration now they expanded to hospitals uh, and toxicology and clinical units. So initially it was to start teaching. And uh, during that, uh, over the last 10 years, what we learned is that uh, teaching is not enough, and then we embark on some of the observational studies, and then we move on to uh, some of the clinical uh, intervention studies in the hospital to show the effect of, uh, so, so that you have a local evidence produced from Sri Lankan setting. Now it has been expanding uh, uh, and then producing more postgraduates. So I'm going to show you some of the evidence narrated to this collaboration and uh, impact of clinical pharmacies. The first uh, study, uh, part of this collaboration, we published uh, an observation study and looking at whether there are opportunities for medicine optimization in Sri Lanka. So uh, we did a study in Raghun Hospital in collaboration with clinicians and the Department of Pharmacology there. And uh, we found that in two medical wards, patients presenting with uh, all sorts of disease, there were 274 opportunities for medicine optimization, which is pretty high, 2.7 per patients. And, uh, and then we embarked onto an active project by one of our uh, uh, graduates, uh, Krishan. She published these uh, studies, uh, her finding in WHO Latin. So this is the uh, control, uh, the intervention study control uh, is the, uh, where the patient receives standard care. And to add to that, uh, we have the clinical pharmacy services to the intervention group, and we look at whether that reduced the uh, drug-related problem or whether that has improved the medicines optimizations. So this, not surprisingly, as it is consistent with the published evidence from elsewhere, so drug-related problem will result in many cases, which is statistically significant compared to control groups. Medicine appropriate index uh, is, uh, is low, so therefore patients getting appropriate medicine uh, in intervention group compared to control groups. And also the patient while discharging, they, they got appropriate medi medications uh, in, in the intervention group. So that was the, the one of the breakthrough study in clinical pharmacy in Sri Lanka, and a number of researchers emerged after it. And then another young researcher um, from the um, University of Pearland, she's now working at the Open University. 
She did a, a more different study on diabetes, again, uh, counseling, uh, clinical pharmacy services in outpatient clinic. And she did a, a, a two various means of uh, leaflets and, and the verbal counseling at four months consecutively. And then what she found is the improves any medication adherence and fair control of uh, disease progression and improve knowledge on patients' medications. So what important is this, uh, so you can show that uh, clinical pharmacies make a difference, as shown in the published literature, but whether the service will be accepted by, by the, the rest of the team as part of the healthcare team. So the study is also looked at that and we found that the acceptability of clinical pharmacies by a doctor is very good, but uh, it was a fair with the nursing uh, staff. And also further, more evidence being generated with, uh, with uh, CKDU, which is one of the one of the key issues in most of the points, where whether pharmacists counseling on those patients will it, will it boost the uh, progression of CKDU. And the studies again demonstrate the benefit by improving the um, EGFR and medication endurance. Low the medication stroke scores are much better, as you can see in this uh, post-interventional treatment. And then currently there are ongoing studies uh, on uh, ES ESRB patients. Again, it's a, uh, important in the current hospitals. Uh, Sculpin is doing that, and she was shadowed in Oxford University, and got trained there, and uh, her supervisor also in Roma, the supervisor from the UK. This is a typical uh, you know, dialysis unit, or uh, you'll find she's counseling the patient from multiple medications. So, and I want to show you an example of ERP communications uh, as part of this study, Kalpani uh, did. So she identified some of the drug-related problems, and they can see the acceptance by, by the consultants and the medical officers, what are the recommendations she makes. So this study is still on writing and hopefully it will be published. And again, another student looking at um, cardiovascular study, uh, Mr. Bhagyamata. Again, he was scheduled in the Royal Brisbane Hospital in, in, in Brisbane and, and trained in, in clinical pharmacy. So evidence in general, it will generate, we'll have more evidence that will be generated and it will be consistent with the uh, established literature. And now it is time, um, for the government to consider whether these evidence are enough to turn into a, a practice. So very important is uh, creating more positions or, or, or hypothetical positions within the hospital where uh, in, uh, not in every hospital to start with and some of the hospitals and see whether this uh, addition of uh, addition of clinical pharmacy would improve the overall patient care. So so we need to demonstrate uh, the clinical pharmacy workforce in uh, various hospitals and how that will align with the, uh, the national policies. Capacity building is one of the key important and uh, there are a lot of uh, trainings are being created in clinical pharmacy and only uh, now is where the, the government need to consider uh, giving them um, positions based on the evidence generator. So what will happen um, how this uh, clinical pharmacy will uh, help um, in, uh, in Sri Lankan setup. Um, so it is it's important that uh, my medication related problem can be minimized, especially the benefit that goes to the patient to reduce the, uh, the burden and readmission can be reduced as shown in the restored, uh, studies. And the bed capacity does, does a result of a readmission, uh, a reduction in readmission can be reduced. And the chemical pharmacy workforce is one of the, it is aligning with national monitoring policy, which has been currently revised for 2020 to 2025. And um, the, work, the optimal medication medicines delivery is part of, uh, part of the policies. It also aligned with the uh, Commonwealth Medical Association, Commonwealth Pharmaceutical Association, to commit uh, increase allied health and pharmacy services. And also it will assist in commitment to manage uh, non the disease and reduce the antimicrobial resistance. And WHO has a high priority to reduce the, uh, the 
medicines related harm by 50% in 2022. So it is also aligned with the WHO policy. So just uh, to conclude my talk, um, so uh, young researchers in clinical pharmacies will continue to evolve and they will, um, their skill and train and clinical pharmacies will be uh, available for the government for them to work. Evidence of benefit of clinical pharmacy service from Sri Lanka is uh, steadily increasing. We will continue to produce more evidence. So there are a lot of research groups are working on that. And uh, so that is again producing consistent results as published uh, in, in, in elsewhere. So it is a high time for authority to transform based on the evidence, solid evidence that generated and published, and by creating more hospital positions. Implementation of chemical pharmacies in a multidisciplinary practice will require more appropriate training, as Professor Tula also highlighted, the continuous professional developments and continuous uh, proper appraisal system in place will enrich their skills and they will strive to perform well. More finding and also larger cohort of interventional studies are important that obviously will continue to uh, come up in time to come. And increased local capacity building to sustain the academic and teaching and research is important as currently most of the critical pharmacies teaching and research are mostly supervised by collaborators from Australia and UK. So time to come it will be overtaken by um, uh, local uh, clinical pharmacists. So this week work, whatever I have presented, is all part of our collaborative work between uh, SACTRI, Casper, and Ministry of Peralania, and all the key members, especially our young talented pharmacy graduates who are working on this uh, difficult research, and Australian clinical and European UK clinical pharmacists. I like to acknowledge and I also thank everyone for part of the study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pani, for that very interesting and very informative presentation and for your suggestions for future, future research. Thank you so much. I'm sure that uh, this will be a very useful presentation for the pharmacy department. Okay, now the uh, four presentations are open for discussion, the questions and the answering session.
have more opportunity here and I'm sure Dr. Kottanji as the Dean can encourage them to do more work in this field, especially with our credits and love. It's easier for you all than other universities. The thing is funds are also available with the schools. Only thing is people won't go there and collaborate. That is the problem. Actually, we have established a collaboration in we have established a collaboration with the uh, sports ministry. Uh, Can you explain? Uh, at the moment, uh, we have uh, started a collaboration with the sports medicine. Right. Uh, and uh, they have bought in uh, new equipment, new tax machines, and. Uh, I think Pratik, you said a very good point. Why people have the money and not joining in? It's yeah. motivated. They don't have motivation to join. That's the trouble. And. Dr. Payam was very good in presenting and yourself as well about, about the research and the value of research and also talking about evidence-based um, approach. I think it's quite good to talk about evidence-based approach when you work in the clinical settings and, and about team as well because we had, uh, it's been quite difficult to think about getting a team approach consciousness into this team. I'm quite happy that most of the other students who came from Peregrine, at least I know a lot of people are persuaded PhD programs and I don't know, I think they have about first access already about about 15 PhD holders. So so they are doing the progress, but I think collecting data and, and evidence based approach will definitely help only the parents, but also the institution and also the nation. Your field is, uh, Samira, you, you are in the sports physiology field? Yes, yes ma'am. Yeah, so you have a lot of scope there. At the moment, madam, we, we have established a uh, human performance lab. Okay. Uh, in the of sports medicine. Right. And uh, now we have started testing athletes on their cardiopulmonary response to exercises. Okay. And depending on the results, we are planning to give uh, uh, proper training regimes to increase uh, different aspects of the testing. Yeah, that's and very nice to know actually. And you mentioned certain other factors about yes. the nutrition and all yeah. that. Yeah, biomechanics so, is a big, uh, big problem here because even uh, our coaches are not, the, they, they think that the way you keep your, you know, should in running, so in simple terms, biomechanics or ergonomics, those areas are, even the coaches are not familiar with those. So you, you can go into those areas and also especially because you are in that field, you have a lot of scope with all the other people here. It has to be a multidisciplinary approach for this kind yes. of study. So yes. we have, uh, we have uh, talked to all the universities including uh, from the University of and uh, even statisticians. Yes. Uh, and we have come up with a multidisciplinary team. Very uh, good. Two yeah. psychologists, nutritionists, and uh, uh, biomechanic engineers. Right. So okay. we are going to uh, go with the team approach to build up the performance of Very the good. Yes. Nice to hear. Yes. Very, yeah. Yeah. yes. I think you can do a lot in the future. Any other questions? Dr. Fahani, you have mentioned that you have done the studies in a private hospital in Sri Lanka. No, it's a uh, government hospital. No? Government hospital. Yeah. Not in a private so, hospital. Uh, no, it's in a uh, teaching hospital. And also teaching hospital and rather for a teaching hospital for the number. And then currently we are doing a uh, study in a uh, teaching hospital. Yeah. You get so it's yeah. Do you get these clinical pharma pharmacist positions in any of uh, this uh, harder position in any of our hospitals, private hospitals or in government of Private hospital to some extent uh, they work uh, and they don't have uh, do full flash clinical pharmacy services. Uh, they found the leading hospitals in uh, Kalamu, they do it. But uh, the government hospital positions yes. are not there. You know, so, and that's one of the aim of this talk. And we have now evidence to show that uh, it, that it will benefit the 
overall interdisciplinary team care, and that will help obviously doctors who are all over the world. And um, so hopefully, you know, with the government uh, decisions and policy making and card version, there might be uh, just to start with a few positions created and then see how it goes. A question from uh, Professor Tola, I'm uh, Dean of yeah. uh, Now you discussed our uh, strength and weaknesses of education for research innovation. So what, uh, what I observed, uh, the one of the weaknesses for this technology gap for the innovation type research. Uh, uh, we have a, tech, see a severe technology gap. We say we, even we uh, buy instruments, but uh, continuous operation, we have some problems. The innovative research, to go to the innovative research. What is your idea about that? Well, I think, you know, um, if I say so, I was advising one of the uh, uh, senior people in Serbia as a mentor. And then she's one of the European country ladies, and she just qualified, and then she said, what should I do? I said, look, focus on research and innovation in your country. That means we shouldn't really try to compete with, for example, uh, the, you know, the others, are, but we can be innovative ourselves. Say, for example, toxicology. Uh, you know, we were kind of forums, and that's why Dr. Fahim has got so much collaboration from Australia, because the simple observations that we made came in a way like uh, OP poisoning, for example, was like happening. And I remember I did a very kind of very superficial study about um, about the deaths after OP poisoning because we were doing night critical care, and then most patients who came at the night died, and then the physicians never even saw them the following day. So they thought it was only a spinal problem, but we thought there was something else. So we just published something about saying the heart will be more. And 10 years later, I was introduced to an uh, American team saying, well, he is the man who said that there's a heart is in the You see what I mean? So innovation comes. So what we need to do really is focus into the problems we have uh, uh, in Sri Lanka. And then the innovations will come when we start doing research in proper methodology. That's why I, I showed, say for example, road traffic accidents. You do this, and then you know if you really look into the root causes, you know you might even find that some of the rules are wrong. See what I mean? So, so that is why you need to really think about uh, collecting data and then analyze. And the innovations will come through. It will not be something ever observed from. Uh, from somewhere else. I mean, I remember writing a letter, a paper once to an American toxicology journal, and I, it's a scrap paper, I just sent it, and then the editor sends me, oh, we like your paper because you start your project where everybody else has finished. So you never expected that, but it comes up. So never get disheartened. Money will follow through if you are doing good research because internationally people will say, oh, this is uh, something interesting, it's relevant for us, and so on. So when you get two researchers, they don't have barriers, there's no age gap, there's no country gap, they all become friends, so you find it. So I don't think you need to be disheartened about this. Get the students to you know, talk about evidence, talk about research, good data, bad data, good evidence, and then you get there. So uh, just just do it that way, and, and money, you have grants that is accessible. So grant applications, for example, is something that we don't even teach properly. So that's something that you can uh, you know, focus on, get some people who have grants, etc., and see how they get international grants. So that's another way of finding the money. So, I mean, sometimes it's a waste to say, in parenting, they had a, when I was there, they had a confocal micro, which is huge, excellent, some 80 million or something like that. And it was never used. It was all closed, locked up. So can you see how, how we waste have our energy and money and this thing without actually putting it to use? 
So, so it's like, I think, you know, do things, as you said, I was so like, quite impressed with Dr. Cohen's research. He's using whatever that is there to innovate things, and you can see the concept of teamwork is coming in. I'm sure you do a good job, uh, Dr. Darshan. Actually, sir, the same thing that what I said, um, we have instruments, but continuous operations. But the functioning of the instruments, uh, we have some problem, as what you said in the era So we have sometimes uh, sophisticated instruments, but difficult to continuously function like other countries. Uh, there is a gap uh, that we have a lack of either technician's knowledge or so we we'll have to fulfill these areas uh, because, because, because before true, true, true. that is very true. But uh, in my own experience, what I have learned is that you know trying to introduce short courses like you know whatever. So those sustainability issues will get slowly sorted out. So if you introduce short courses like a one day or two day courses, then people will start to get a short certificate for a certain skill. And then that will be, that can come together at some point and it will be really valuable. So as a developing country and that is the way we can focus. I mean I am now been working in a developed country for ten years. You don't get anything for free at all. You have to really hard to find and then then you know justify and then get it. So when you justify it, you get one. That's how it goes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chula. Any members from radiology department? Anyone? Now this doctor, uh, Professor Negaji study, right? Now he has given values for the for Japan. Now we have a very high incidence of breast cancer patients. Now is it possible for us to do to get the values for Sri Lanka? Going on here or Sri Lanka? Yes. Sri Lanka, there are studies are going on. Well, the Nikolai University and the other colleagues also doing the same. Same, and they are yeah, trying to find the figures for us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Actually, I wanted to ask a question from the professor from Japan, but I don't know how can I can with the message. Uh, because it's a recorded, and unfortunately, it's a recorded message. We are later on, you will be able to convey the, but not. It's not an online presentation. We are unable to connect with it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm, I'm sure there are many from pharmacy department. I think that was a very useful presentation. And. Can ask you this, you the uh, yes. Yes. So, what is the uh, yeah, so the question that she can ask? What is your question there? Yes, I know that uh, for the measurements, he used a class type of dosimeters, thermal illumination dosimeters. Why he chose that kind of dosimeter? That is my question. Yes. Any other questions from the Department of Pharmacy? Uh, yes, can you hear me? I am uh, Professor Mahindra. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is regarding this uh, interaction of clinical pharmacy in your hospitals. So I think that our physicians and the clinicians have to be consulted before and we have to be educated. Because uh, way back in uh, 2008 or 9, we have done some small question. Uh, very few people heard about this term, medical pharms, including doctors. And other thing I can uh, in my device is that the uh, use of clinical pharmacologists. Uh, what about the clinical pharmacologists? We don't have clinical pharmacologists. Uh, the mind uh, you are a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. You are talking about clinical pharmacists now. 
1998, when I returned after PhD, I wanted to start critical care. And there wasn't an emergency medicine. And then uh, one of the, I would say, I wouldn't say any names, directors of the PGM said, we all are managing emergencies, why aren't we? Why do we want emergency medicine? <laughs> now, how do I answer that question to top of the person who should install such program? Now, uh, same thing, critical care, nobody understood critical care. So, we organized a march from, I remember walking from Murray County with a, a few people shouting about critical care, why it was needed. So, so, you've got to go somewhere, you know. If you give a questionnaire to anybody, they say no. So, no is not an answer. That was the right answer. Yeah, no answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, because in 1999, there was a paper that came from, say, to Earth is human, E-R-R, Earth is human. And that came because of medical error. And then the whole process about quality and safety in medicine started. And quality and safety in medicine is mostly about medical areas where the clinical farms is come in. So you need to go and talk and give a huge talk saying quality and safety in medicine and there it is you need clinical farms. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Education of the clinicians and, um, and the nursing staff is very important. Mm -hmm. And last year we did a workshop, uh, uh, a seminar at teaching hospital here at India, inviting all the clinicians and the nursing staff to come and see, uh, to introduce the concept of clinical pharmacy and what we do. I think the participations were good, and. Uh, and, and, and it's, it, it's important that then to acknowledge that there will be a system that will come in and uh, that we need to uh, somehow tackle that and with the, again, evidence-based research. Um, one of the issue currently preventing is that we don't have a position, so we place it in the government hospitals. So if you have a position in the government hospital, obviously, you know, I mean, as, a, as a research and academic, I mean, there are volunteers, they can come and educate clinical farms as most of the clinicians here, which is the concept and they know the setup and they all are doing foreign training in Australia, UK or USA. And they know the value of clinical farms and they are not blinded on that. So um, uh, how you pre present that and with the base evidence base is what be important. And um, you know, first the policy makers has to come up with some of the positions and then um, and then the the academics and the researchers and the pharmacists working in hospitals need to work together and um, and solve all the barriers that come as as, it, uh, as we progress. The next question was uh, you were mentioning about clinical farm colleagues. They have a completely different world compared to what clinical pharmacists we see. So and again, uh, that that area has to be uh, properly defined. So. I'm sure time to come. Uh, so we'll have all sorted. Oh, and hopefully I'm optimistic that the evidence that are generated is uh, and uh, generated will be not. And, and importantly, most of uh, the research partners are clinicians. So from Peradenia, Ragam, Kalamu, and Ralph, they are all clinicians. So they, they, uh, they, they have aspiration to improve the, the patient care. So, hope things will be good in the future. So, this is a suggestion from you, Dr. Pani. Now, uh, yeah. is it possible for you all to do a study on now we have in the community? There are many people who are, who are taking treatment from more than two or three consultants. And they have two or three prescriptions. Right? And, uh, just to check their knowledge about these drugs, right? Whether there's an overlap and adverse reactions, and whether they are taking an overdose or they are being educated and all that. Any studies of that nature conducted? 
Ceilalți. Yes, uh, yeah, thanks. I'm proud of my colleague uh, in Japur, uh, the government for university. She has done a lot of uh, similar studies on that. And, uh, and also she has published uh, on prescription reviews and how that's important and how you improve the, the patient care in the, in the community settings. And yeah, so more studies also coming up. And uh, we are slowly progressing with, uh, with our 10 years of graduates coming in. So, and uh, things will, we will have to look at as it will be here with more training. And we will have to make more independent researchers in the field of pharmacy, all of our community, clinical, and industry. Um, so, I'm sure it will flourish with, uh, with more motivated people coming into the field. And these are areas uh, which I mentioned in Madam is one of the high priority research area in all the world. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Questions from the online participants. Any questions? So I just like to approve what Dr. Fahim said. It's, uh, it's very good way to do collect the data and generate the data and everything. And then use it to change practice eventually. And that's the way to go because um, even you might know the Allied has graduates with exactly 2010, they didn't get the jobs in the Ministry of Health. So, so that's the way it goes. So you, don't, you will not get gender pharmacy vacancies and then ask you to uh, apply for it. But instead, you show the benefits of them through your research and the masses will join you. Once the masses will join you, then you get the political leadership support. That's how it goes. So I remember where, how the emergency medicine and medical care was uh, approved as a health, as a separate object area for Sri Lanka in 2011 after doing a database presentation to then health minister on the role of microscopic parts and he said, oh, we should do this. That's how it got into health place. And that's how it eventually became a specialty. So you need to pursue, you'll get there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. We had a very lively discussion on the on this presentation. Now, uh, and we are on time. And uh, I think we had very, very interesting four presentations. Three on very specific areas. Pharmacy, uh, radiotherapy, and then one on sports medicine and Prosecura Gurasekura, one was on if all the allied fields are of and very enlightening on research and innovation. And I'm sure you all gained a lot. And may I they suggested me there were lots of ideas and you all have a take home message. So it's very important you continue these studies. Right? And there were many suggestions and Dr. Pahani suggested and Professor Chula's suggestions. And so it's very important that as a university and for you to continue this kind of this research and especially the, the multidisciplinary team, various fields in allied science and pharmacy, physiotherapy, as well as uh, nursing, they all can get together and conduct this kind of studies. So it's very interesting and I think today's was a very successful session. With with all these difficulties. I was a little worried when I started thinking about these online presentations and uh, I was worried that I meet me, there may be breakups and all that, but luckily we never had any problem. So if everything went off well. Any other suggestions from you all? So I'm happy about the output. And I, uh, I thank all the online presenters. Uh, Professor Chula Gunasekar, Dr. Fani, we are very thankful to you and please wait till the end because there are some certificate presentations and we want you to be there for that. So no, be with us. Thank you, Madam. That was a very interesting and a lively discussion and we believe that all will leave this conference with a better understanding about the theme of this plenary session. Sustainable and innovative healthcare approach to strengthen the national health security. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to invite 
Dr. Darshan and Kottaharji, the Dean, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, to present a token of appreciation to the chairperson and the speakers of the plenary session. Let me cordially invite Professor Mirani Mirasuria to receive her token of appreciation. 